Our next talk, uh, Justin will talk, talk about cross-device tracking, measurement, and disclosures. All right, is that good? Can you hear me? That's good, thanks. Uh, so this is some research I did with some colleagues at the FTC, Phoebe, Aaron, and Tina, um, on cross-device tracking, uh, how companies can kind of correlate what you do on one computer to another device. Uh, this sort of research was very novel for the FTC. We've never really done this sort of thing before. It was certainly novel for me. Um, I'm not an academic. I do not have an academic background. Uh, I do not have a computer science background. So this talk will be a little different than some other, other ones. We kind of meander a little bit through uh, uh, law and policy and business practices, maybe more than some other talks. Um, what is the FTC? Um, I added this slide last night after talking to a bunch of folks here um, who seemed to have no idea who we were or why we might be interested in showing up. Um, so with two different missions, one um, antitrust um, and then consumer protection is the side that we're on. Um, there's no dedicated privacy law or general privacy law in the United States, unlike a lot of other countries like the GDPR um, recently passed in the EU. Um, but FTC has been worked on privacy for about um, at least 20 years. They've had the Division of Privacy and Identity Protection, which is kind of the de facto um, uh, DPA in the United States. Um, what do we do? So we don't enforce a dedicated privacy law, but we do have these very old 100-year-old statutes uh, for basic consumer protection. Um, thou shalt not deceive people and don't be unfair. The, the test for unfairness, which has evolved over the years, um, has to cause harm, can't be avoidable, not offset by countervailing benefits. Um, but we've, we've enforced these in dozens and dozens and probably hundreds of, of, of privacy and, and data security cases. Um, one thing I do want to highlight for y'all is that you know, a lot of the work we do, the enforcement work, does come out of academia. Um, so one recent example, the InMobi case we have. Um, InMobi is a, a mobile advertising network. Um, they were evading device location controls. They were kind of using BSS IDs as a proxy, even when you had location turned off, and so we brought a case there. Um, John the Mayor uh, is an academic um, who found that Google was dropping double click cookies on Safari, even though Safari is configured not to do that. Um, the Silver Push warning letters, it was exciting to see uh, someone on the last panel um, talk about Silver Push. I actually wrote those letters. Um, so we try to keep up with the, the academic literature, but always don't always do a great job. So um, reach out, pitch us on stuff, um, let us know what you're working on. Um, okay, one last slide on the FTC. We do policy guidance, we do education. And then what this is and what we're trying to do more of is sometimes we draw attention to emerging practices. And so my group is pretty new, um, Office of Technology Research and Investigation, um, trying to figure out uh, exactly what we're doing at the FTC. Um, uh, but sometimes things aren't necessarily illegal, um, but maybe they did, we think they need a little more transparency. And so that's what we, what we thought about cross-device tracking, which led to this, this research. Um, so cross-device tracking, um, we try to set up a study to see you know, what uh, data collection on two different devices we could detect um, in, in, along with disclosures about cross-device tracking. Um, before that, we reached out to a bunch of uh, companies to have them explain to us what they actually do. So I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about um, what we've learned as kind of some of the industry practices. Um, okay, so everyone knows how, how traditional cookie tracking works, um, but companies don't really love cookies. They're not really that useful for a lot of things. They're not inter-device. Inter They're not even really intra-device, right? They can't be used to correlate what you do um, across different apps, uh, across different browsers. Um, they're also not traditionally tri tied to personally identifiable information, um, partly because these, these companies really wouldn't have a relationship to get that um, previously. Um, also, got the privacy concerns. A lot of people didn't love the idea of companies tracking us around the web by real name. Um, this paid game issue in uh, 2001, DoubleClick, before they were bought by Google, um, merged with a company called Abacus, which is a data broker. Um, a lot of people were concerned that they're going to merge those databases and start watching what you do by real name. Um, FTC got involved long before it was there. And they closed the case. They said, we're closing it because DoubleClick promised they weren't going to merge the data sets. They're going to keep it anonymous. And so for a lot, a lot of uh, years, there's always the, the, the argument, well, why you cared about this? It's always anonymous. Um, that's obviously changed a lot in practice. But in a, a lot of like, the way companies talk about this and a lot of the privacy policies, um, you do see this distinction between name and email. OK, there we're not going to share. But cookies, IP, URL, um, that's, um, that's totally fine. Um, but as we're going to see in a little bit, that's obviously broken down a lot. Um, and so the companies that still use cookies, um, but they're, you know, now there's a lot more devices out there, a lot more data they don't have as much visibility into, and, and it's harder to, to tie it all together. Um, 
the use cases, I mean, obviously, targeting is, is an intuitive one. If I almost buy those shoes on one device, um, maybe they'll show me an ad for on, on another. Um, but in practice, a lot of companies told us they don't do that, because that would creep people out. Um, instead, they do things that are a little harder to see, like analytics or measurement. Um, and attribution is actually one of the primary use cases that a lot of companies describe to us. So if I see an ad for Wonder Bread on my phone, later if I purchase that on Amazon on my, left, my desktop computer, or I hit the Buy Now Smart button on my toaster, um, or I, I purchase it at a grocery store, the company that delivered the ad really wants to know that, because um, then they can say to Wonder Bread um, how, how awesome our ads are and try to get more money from them. Um, so two different methods that companies primarily use to do this sort of thing. Uh, probabilistic, where they kind of make guesses based on shared attributes, and then deterministic, um, where they tie thing, uh, to the devices together um, with a persistent real-world identifier, um, often an email address. So how does probabilistic work? I'm a company. I have visibility to these three devices, but I have no way to really tie them together. But then over time, I start seeing information that maybe I, I can use to make correlations between them. So, um, this one computer on the left, uh, they see I, I kind of use the same IP address um, during weekdays from 9 to 5. Um, I sh that seems to share a local network with his phone for, during that time period. Uh, and then in the evenings, that phone seems to share uh, a, a local network with um, a different device, which is, tends to be on on nights and weekends. And so maybe, maybe I guess like one's a work computer for one person, and then there's their cell and their home. And then they can try to add in other attributes too. So if they get geolocation, right? Maybe they can say with a little more certainty that yeah, these these devices are together um, for a lot a lot of the time. Uh, and then they can add in uh, behavioral data too. So they can see on certain devices that the person is browsing the same sorts of sites. So um, like technology news, University of Virginia sports, um, a blog about Capitol Hill, um, Arsenal football program. Um, these are this is what I um, read, and there's probably like, no one else in the world who kind of reads those same sets of of, of, of devices. There has been some good research on on how uniquely identifying um, browsing behavior is, um, but this is the company, something the companies do tend to use um, to kind of make correlations a little more certain. So, and then they have their 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 device graph. It obviously evolves over time, but um, that's 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 the basic um, way that, that uh, uh, they've been described as how how it works. Um, and this is deterministic, and there's a couple different flavors of how this works. And so, you know, we log onto lots of different devices, uh, lots of different services like email and social networking. Um, but those services don't just stay on Google and Facebook, for example. Um, they provide a functionality on a lot of other places where they can log what you do. Um, so Google obviously keeps track of the places I go. Um, this is not surprising. Um, uh, I'm kind of glad they do this because if I see that someone logged in from Malaysia, then I've been hacked. Um, but Google doesn't just stay on Google. Here I am reading on the Washington Post, innocently trying to learn about a pink wine. Um, but I'm not just on the Washington Post. Um, I'm, there's lots of other services here. Um, I'm here. Facebook is here. Twitter is here. Pinterest is here. I'm sure Google is here somewhere, right? And so um, the Ghostry uh, logo in the corner indicates there are 29 different services on here, one of which is almost certainly Google. So if I'm still logged in to Google and Facebook and Twitter, and maybe even if I'm not, they have the ability to add that to their cross-device profile about me. Um, and so here I am. I log into these services as, as Justin. Um, but wherever else they see me on those services, they can build a pretty rich profile about me. Um, and it's okay, so not all companies get that data. And there, a lot of people aren't Facebook or Google. A lot of companies like Turn or Rubicon Project or AppNexus don't have this data, so how can they get it? Um, they'll often partner with companies that do get login data. Um, so let's say when I log into, say, the Huffington Post, um, they could send to whoever they want, um, hey, this is Justin. Uh, there is trepidation, like I said, about sharing personal information. So a lot of times they'll just share a hash of it. And so um, they'll, they'll convert my name into a, to a, to a basic hash. And so here I am, the network has visibility to me, no way to know who I am. But if I log into uh, different services on different devices with the same identifier, they could have relationships with those partners to send them a hash of my, of my uh, personal information, and then they can have their device graph about me. Um, it's an interesting legal question if hash personal information is still personal information. It does provide some layer of protection. Um, Ed Felton, uh, who uh, uh, was chief technologist at the FTC, uh, the first one, um, has a really good blog post if you're interested in learning more and thinking through the various issues uh, around that. There are variations. A lot of times companies do both probabilistic and deterministic. Um, and then sometimes they'll share, right? If I'm a company, I, have no, I don't have the technology to do it, I might partner with a cross-device company to, to get their graph. And so 
sorry about the fuzziness of this thing. I stole it from the paper. Um, uh, I have three cookies, three, three identifiers on different devices. I have no idea, no way to relate them. Um, I, could, I could arrange to send those to, the cross, to, to a cross-device tracking company who will also get their own identifiers um, uh, about me. Um, they already have a graph of me based on their identifiers. And so then offline, they can say, hey, we think cookie 1234 and cookie ABCD and IDFA, whatever, are connected. That'll be invisible, except for the fact that there was um, cookie syncing going on. Um, OK, so um, a lot of build-up to get to our study. Um, so what we did is we went to 100 different sites on two different computers, try to see what quarter of data could be collected, could be shared um, to enable cross-device um, or third-party device correlation. Um, uh, unsurprisingly, we saw hundreds and hundreds of, of companies on both devices collecting information. We did see a lot of, of, of cookie syncing and sharing of hashed identifiers, um, though those could be for other purposes. And then uh, we went through the privacy policies to try to figure out um, if there's any disclosures about how this works, um, and um, there were not. Um, so uh, here we are. We, we, um, you know, this, this is not surprising to people who have followed this space for a while. Um, companies have embed a lot of third parties um, who then embed a lot of other third parties. Um, Times of India was the, the winner of our competition, um, sharing on average of the 120 uh, third parties um, of, 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 on each run. Um, we, in all, we found, we found 861 uh, different uh, domains were connected on both devices. Um, they could use this information to start doing probabilistic uh, correlation. Uh, and we also saw some companies that are dedicated cross-device companies um, uh, uh, in, in these results. Um, so Drawbridge, TapAd are probably considered to be um, the leaders in, in this space. Uh, we saw them in about 30% um, of, of, of the sites that we went to. Um, and also, the you know, sites we log into tend to show up a lot in, in, the, in these results. And so um, DoubleClick, uh, run by Google, um, was on 87.5% of, of all the sites that we went to. Facebook also um, on about 70% of the sites that we went to. Um, these numbers are, are similar to um, other, other surveys that have been done. Um, and Google and Facebook are actually now explicit in their policies that, yeah, um, they do this. Uh, uh, Facebook started about two years ago, um, changing their privacy policy to allow it. Google, maybe maybe three. Google about one. Um, Amazon, you know, they, they you know, people are logged into Amazon, but they also provide a lot of web services. Their policy is vague. Um, Verizon, Yahoo, also not clear. Um, Twitter, um, just two months ago, actually changed their privacy policy to allow that. So even if you're not logged into Twitter, um, they'll now be collecting this, uh, the, the, their widget data about you around the web in order to target ads for you. Um, previously, they honored do not track, the do not track setting, um, and now they no longer do that. Um, we did see uh, a lot of sharing of hashed email addresses. So 16 of the 100 sites we saw um, did share um, common hashes with about 60 third parties. Um, it could well have been a lot more than this. We just looked for very common hashes, um, MD5, SHA-1, SHA-256, um, maybe one or two others, um, and not um, salted or encoded in any way. So they may well have been sharing um, uh, a lot more. Um, but that's still a substantial amount of, of sharing of that information. That could be used for cross-device tracking. It could be used for other purposes as well, maybe trying to tie to offline data, not entirely clear. Um, we also saw a lot, a lot of cookie syncing. And so um, here in the, on the left, we see you know, Demdex, for example, shared cookie ID with 150 different companies. Um, so it could have been doing that in at least some of those instances in order to, to get back uh, information about uh, uh, cross-device correlations. Um, the parties on the right are the ones who collected it. So they could be maybe providing to those parties on the left information about cross-device correlation. Um, we we uh, used a, a Princeton script um, to, to find examples of cross-device tracking and then um, kind of inspected it manually and said, yeah, that looks like cross-device tracking. Uh, that looks like cookies uh, syncing. Um, probably it's actually a lot more than that. A lot of companies we expected to see on there we didn't see. Um, that said, we also have no reason, no way to know if this was done for, for cross-device. Um, cookie syncing is an incredibly common practice for uh, just real-time bidding. So uh, they've probably, these companies probably would have been doing it anyway. So um, hard to say what exactly is going on. So then we looked at the privacy policies of the 100 sites to see what they said about whether this is happening or not. Um, and there is incredibly little information available. Um, only three talked about it at all. So this one um, site said, we do share uh, information in ways that could be used to link users' devices. Um, by and large, they didn't say much about it. Um, a lot of them did uh, 
uh, reflect this, this distinction I talked about in the beginning about the distinction between personal information, non-personal information, reserving broad rights to do whatever for non-personal information, um, unclear, and then, and then not sharing email address. Is hashed email address um, considered personal information? It's not clear. Uh, the privacy policies seem to not be written with this in mind. Um, they all basically describe basic behavioral advertising, um, and a lot of them predated a lot of these practices. So they seem to be written in ways that just didn't even think about it. Um, but I think a lot of the language could be read conceptually broad enough to allow for certainly probabilistic tracking, um, but in some cases deterministic as well. We didn't look at the privacy policies of the 861 third-party domains because it sounded exhausting, um, but it might be worthwhile. Um, so how much cross-device tracking is going on? I have no idea. Um, that's kind of the, the conclusion of the study. Um, there are a few things we do know. There are some big first, party, uh, first parties like uh, Google and Facebook who do have a pretty broad third party reached as well. Um, a lot of companies are interested in getting into this space. Um, it's not entirely clear how mature their practices are. Uh, we did see a lot of data sharing that could be used for cross-device tracking, um, but could be for other purposes as well. And, and the privacy policies we looked at um, were written, written pretty broadly and could be interpreted expansively to allow for this. A um, couple areas where um, we are doing some research and it'd be good to see some more research. Um, we tested some smart TVs. <clears throat> um, uh, email is a very common way for companies to do cross-device tracking. If you open a URL or email, it's often tied to your email address or a hash of it. Um, uh, Carnegie Mellon is actually doing some really good work on, on finding evidence of, of, of uh, cross-site, uh, cross-device retargeting. Um, it'd be nice if someone wanted to review all those privacy policies. Um, uh, seeing which ad blockers are effective at stopping this sort of stuff um, would be interesting too. And then um, legal analysis, we didn't do um, a legal analysis of whether this violates, what practices might violate you know, US law, let alone um, the, the new GDPR, but that might be interesting to see as well. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions y'all might have. Thank you.